Welcome to uh, the Ocean Connector event for June 2020. Uh, my name is Jim Hanlon. I'm the CEO here at Cove, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. We have an exciting guest speaker this afternoon that I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. But before that, I've got a couple of um, special things I want to say. First of all, a shout out to our continuing sponsors for the Ocean Connector series, Killam Properties and Cox and Palmer. Uh, we really do thank you for your support. And of course, our programming is supported uh, in general by uh, the, uh, our good friends at Irving Shipbuilding, so we thank them as well. Uh, first off, I'd uh, like to mention something we're doing uh, in collaboration with a program called Deep Sense. This is a uh, research and development program that's uh, headquartered at Dalhousie University. Uh, we work collaboratively with them on um, commercialization opportunities for data analytics in the ocean. And um, they've just launched a new uh, LinkedIn group that I, I want to point at you all towards. Uh, the, the slide it's showing on the screen now will give you the, uh, the cue to how to find it. But if you're interested at all in ocean data and art artificial intelligence in the context of ocean technology, ocean science, and ocean business, uh, take a look. I think you'll find it uh, quite interesting and uh, a worthwhile connection. So I'm going to now uh, introduce uh, another good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Don Grant. And Don's going to say a few words to us about a new initiative uh, coming out of the Ocean Super Cluster and specifically their startup initiative. So um, Don, if you're ready to go, we'll, uh, we'll turn the wheel over to you and let you say a few words about um, your exciting new pro project. Thanks so much, Jim. And thanks to the Cove team for inviting me. Uh, we have a very exciting initiative that has just launched. It, it, it's the Ocean Startup Challenge. It launched on June 4th, and it's going to be open for applications until August 14th. What we've done with the Ocean Startup Challenge is we have gone out to industry and asked them for feedback on what their pain points are. What problems do they need solved? And we've taken that information back, we've synthesized it, and we've issued a series of challenge statements. And you can find those challenge statements at oceanstartupchallenge.ca. So this is an exciting, exciting project for us. And we've gotten a lot of great feedback on the challenge statements that we've issued so far. I want you to know though, if you don't see yourself fitting into one of the challenge statements that we've put out, there is an other category and we want your idea to come in in the form of an application. So this project and this challenge has $25,000 up for grabs for 10 different companies. Along with that will come business support, we'll have boot camps, uh, and we'll have various mentors to help companies along the way. Also, if you apply and you're one of the successful 10 companies, you will be immediately put into our next competition, which has about a million and a half dollars uh, in prize uh, funding. And it could be up to $200,000 for a company who uh, is successful in that. So on the right side of the screen here, you'll see just some of the key dates. On July 7th, we're having an info session. Uh, we're doing a Lean Canvas workshop on July 9th. The key date is applications close on August 14th. And then the winners are gonna be announced on September 28th. So get to oceanstartupchallenge.ca, have a look, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you uh, applying to the challenge. So this is for startup companies, generally five years or less with, with 15 or less employees. So really excited about it. And, and thanks again to Jim and, and the Cove team for giving me an opportunity to talk about it today. Great, thanks Don, that's exciting. I might have to do a startup. Sounds like there's some really good prize money available there. So thanks very much for that. And uh, do take a look at that if you've got uh, further interest in that exciting new project. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna do a, a bit of an intro here on our guest speaker this afternoon, uh, Moya Cahill. Um, Moya is the uh, CEO of Pangeo Subsea based in St. John's, Newfoundland. They're a technology and service provider of high resolution 3D sub bottom acoustic imaging technology. Pangeo's technology uses synthetic aperture sonar to provide enhanced sub bottom data, imaging buried geohazards to mitigate risk for offshore installations, both for the oil and gas industry and now also for the offshore renewable energy sector. Pangeo's offices in St. John's, Dartmouth, Boston, Aberdeen and Qatar, together with its associate agents, provide Pangeo's clients with a global service delivery capability. Moya is a professional engineer, holds a Bachelor of Engineering in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering from Memorial University of Newfoundland. And she has over 30 years experience in the oil and gas sector, and more recently in offshore renewables as well. 
She started her career in the mid 80s with Norsk Hydro in Norway and then returned to Canada in the early 90s and established her own project management and engineering firm, MNC Group. She later co-founded uh, Pan Maritime Energy Services Incorporated. And with a vision for a global footprint, she uh, established a strong network of clients in the Gulf of Mexico, in the United Kingdom, Norway, Europe, Chile, and the Middle East. In 1994, Ms. Cahill received the Canadian Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award and thereafter was awarded the prestigious Canada's Top 40 Under 40. Most recently, she was honored to receive from NOIA, the Newfoundland and Labrador Oil and Gas Industry Association, the Outstanding Contribution Award, which recognized her role in the development of the offshore industry in Newfoundland and Labrador over the last 20 years. Moya has been involved in a number of community and industry associations. She was chair of the Board of Governors for the College of the North Atlantic, a member of the Newfoundland Premier's Advisory Council on the, Econo on a, on the Economy and Technology, and a member of the federal government's Sectoral Advisory Group for International Trade. Ms. Cahill is past chairman of the Board of Marine Atlantic Incorporated, past director of Maritime Tel and Tel Company in Nova Scotia, past president of the Newfoundland Ocean Industry Association, and was a member of the Federal Task Force for the Future of Canada's Financial Sector. Today, Moya sits on the Board of Directors for Kraken Robotics and is a director on the Board of, of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, and I think we'll hear more about that a little bit later. Moya resides in St. John's, Newfoundland with her two daughters, Mia Andre and Mara. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone and the screen over to you, Moya, for, uh, for your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Let me make sure we've got the, um, I'm sharing my screen here for us all. Are we seeing it here? Looks good. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jim. That was a, that was a long, <laughs> but very accurate uh, description of my some 30 years of uh, being, in the, being in the industry. And certainly it only gets better, you know, when, when, when I reflect back on when I started uh, my engineering in Norway, I never thought I'd be where I am today. Uh, but certainly, you know, all of the experiences that I have that I have compiled over the years, uh, whether it be um, in Norway, in uh, in Europe, in Qatar, uh, in the U.S., it certainly com culminates to where we are today and uh, what we have to offer as a as a Canadian company um, and as a technology company with innovation that uh, that we're looking to expand and to deliver from a global perspective. So today, what I wanted to do was give you a little bit of um, a background to uh, to our folks who are, are viewing us, a little bit about our technology. Uh, we have a, a couple of technologies in our portfolio that I'd like to share with uh, share with us all, um, and talk a little bit of how we evolved in the in the industry from you know looking at imaging boulders in the subsea bed to today looking at UXOs for developments of, you know, worldwide. And I wanted to finish with a little bit about some of our recent COVE initiatives and how I'm looking at uh, certainly um, for new partnerships with regards to how we can collaborate together, um, perhaps in, in some instances on, uh, over, on, under some of our ocean supercluster initiatives uh, to uh, take our, our Canadian technologies global. So as you mentioned, uh, Pangeo is a Canadian company. I started, I co-founded it uh, back in 2006 uh, with uh, Dr. Jacques Guigny. Uh, since that time, we've, uh, we've expanded significantly. Uh, we've got offices in Aberdeen, uh, just re and as well as in Qatar. And uh, certainly we're very, very pleased to have opened up an office in the Cove a number of years ago and thoroughly enjoying our relationships and our growth in, uh, in, uh, at the Cove and also just opened up an office in Boston uh, to truly take advantage and being in being where there's a tremendous growth within the within the uh, offshore wind market in in the US uh, we've been we've been around we've done a significant amount of heavy lifting and we've had tremendous success uh, with our technologies um, uh, certainly we we the innovation of our technology is in Newfoundland, is in St. John's, which is really the headquarters of the company. But it's primarily our markets are primarily um, outside of outside of uh, Newfoundland. Um, it, they're really based in. Uh, we started off in the in the European sector, in the UK sector with oil and gas, and certainly have been very fortunate that we've that we've been able to 
take advantage of a, of a similar type of supply chain, similar types of, of challenges, uh, and have gotten very, uh, very heavily involved in really pioneered site investigations for the offshore, offshore wind sector. And uh, certainly started off in Europe, and now, as I'd mentioned, we're, we're pioneering it in the Northeast. Uh, we've got such, uh, significant, uh, we're written our technology, we positioned our technology, given the fact that we're, we're providing a service, that we're actually written into tenders for some of the major players uh, in, in the offshore renewable. So I'll talk a little bit about what that service is. Um, we, have, um, we have two technologies in our portfolio. And as you mentioned, you know, we're focusing on using acoustics to, to interrogate the subseabed to image geohazards. And when I talk about geohazards, what is a geohazard? And that's really anything from a natural geohazard, such as a, a boulder, uh, to really man-made geohazards that can be any kind of infrastructure debris or unexploded ordinances. And these are primarily mines that have been left over from, uh, from war times, from World War II particularly, and also from somewhat target practices uh, within the, the various Navy, uh, Navy, Navy, and Navy exercises around the world. And we interrogate the seabed uh, using two, te two, two technologies. One is the acoustic core, the other is a sub-bottom imager. And in essence, both of these technologies focus on the same uh, the same application, the same um, algorithms, the same processing techniques, but and the primary difference is the platform that they're sitting on, and that's really what is driving its application. So the first technology, what we call, is the acoustic core, and you see that on the top of my screen there. And the acoustic core is a is a is a is a technology that is on a tripod, so it's collecting that a uh, 3D volumetric uh, uh, data set uh, in a fixed in a in a fixed uh, formation. So when at the end of data collection, we're, we've, we're collecting a data set, a volumetric data set that's some 12 meters wide, and it penetrates the sub seabed 30 to 40 meters. And why do we do that? What application does that have? Well, we're imaging boulders, we're imaging different layers of the seabed, primarily to mitigate the risk for pile, act, pile driving activities, primarily in the oil and gas sector. And then of course, as we appreciate these large wind turbines offshore uh, in Europe, as well as now in the Northeast, are supported by these monopiles or platforms. So in either the oil and gas or renewable, they're all they're all they're already they're always driving piles to support their their infrastructures. So that's what we're doing. We're identifying boulders, identifying different layers of the subseabed so that they can microsite the location of these piles. The second technology uh, is what we call our sub-bottom imager, and actually that's one that really has taken off um, in both sectors. Uh, it is, like I said, same algorithms, the same processing techniques, the same real-time data acquisition, but rather than on a, sitting on a fixed platform, we're actually interfacing it onto a moving platform. We started off in the oil and gas sector when, you know, 10 years ago with, with Statoil when they had big, large ROVs of these uh, big work-class ROVs, which were great, very stable platforms. And very, so what we're doing, we're flying about three and a half meters above the seafloor, and we're now we're collecting a swath of acoustic data. Um, so that, that, that swath is five meters wide and some five to eight meters in the subseabed. So the application is looking at pre-route surveys. So where do I put my pipeline? Where do I put my cable? So we're providing them that data real time. As soon as we collect the, collect the data, we're showing them where the anomalies are, where these geohazards are. And then of course, once these cables and pipelines are buried, the cable wants to know, the, the cable owner wants to know, okay, where did the operator put it? Where did the contractor put it? Did they put it, did they install it uh, to, to depth, to spec? And so we'll come in and do an, uh, an as-laid depth of burial survey for either the cables or the pipelines. Um, talk a little bit about the acoustic core. You folks there in, at the Cove have probably seen our equipment. Uh, we were very proud to use the Cove really as the home of our acoustic core. Uh, that was where this particular kit was bit, built. And we've uh, just finished a pretty significant overhaal of it. We took it, took it, took it, uh, took it apart and put it all back together again using the, our local supply chain in the, in the Nova Scotia area. Uh, so you can see it's a big piece of equipment. Uh, we've got, uh, we, we got, we have our sensors on either side, our high frequency chirp or low frequency chirp, our, our 
our transceivers. So what we're doing there is we're collecting a number of different data sets at one particular time. I've got a little bit of a video that shows really how the AC works offshore. And I'm just gonna turn the volume down, stand by. So we're, you know, we're launching, so we're providing a service. So we'll go offshore. Sometimes we'll bring a vessel to the table, the ROV to the table, our team. And at the end of the day, we're delivering a, a, what we call an answer product to the, to the client. Uh, there you're seeing that acoustic core being launched off the stern of the vessel with an A-frame, but we can just as easily launch it off of a, off of a crane. It weighs about five tons. And when, we're, when we get to about five, six meters above the seafloor, we open up the booms and we lay it down on the seabed and we collect the data. Uh, so this is a very, very high resolution data, uh, piece, uh, data set. We're collecting over 20,000 data sets with resolutions better than 10 centimeters. So we're able to identify anomalies uh, uh, down to 30 meters, 40 meters in the subseabed with resolutions uh, better than 20 centimeters. So it's a significant, a significant technology. And once again, it's all real-time data acquisition. So the client knows right there on site, you know, how 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 can how can we um, uh, adjust the location of our piles such they'll actually miss the boulders or the hard layers in the subseabed. Uh, this is how we interrogate the data real time. So we're, we can slice down into the data set every five to 10, every, every 10 centimeters because we're collecting data at 10 centimeter voxels. And there you're seeing, just like an MRI interrogates your, your organs, we actually use a similar type of, um, type of interrogation uh, tool uh, and display to uh, identify the boulders and the layers in the subseabed. So there you're seeing um, the, um, the identification of the, of the anomalies, discrete anomalies in the subseabed. So that's the acoustic core. And um, what I wanna do now, is talk a little bit about our sub-bottom imager. So the sub-bottom imager, as I mentioned, we've been on our, we, we started off on ROVs and certainly over the years now, as, as we expand into into, into different markets, into different regions. Um, we've, uh, we've, required, we've, we've realized that we, we need to open up the, our ability to collect data in shallow waters and on lighter, lighter vehicles. So we, we, we're looking for versatility. And while we're not a, a platform provider, uh, we certainly look at, we like to keep our proper, uh, as we say, our powder dry. And we work with other platform providers and designers to, to, uh, to, to ensure that we're able to acquire data wherever we go. So certainly uh, we've designed a couple of, uh, we've developed a couple of different interface features. So the ROV is great when you're in, in 10 meters of water, you've got lots of room, lots of, lots of maneuverability, but the vessels are large. And we and we and we recognized early on that this is you know the application for an, a large work class at ROV is not it, it won't be it you know it has its limitations certainly in shallower waters we develop what we call the trailing arm and the trailing arm really can pick up data from about three to ten meters in the subs in 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 in, uh, in the water so it can really what we're trying to do is in, ensure that we're able to collect acquire data right from the shore to the to the platform. And these are some of the different uh, platforms that we've used. So the trailing arm is here where we're really taking that head of our sub bottom imager, the hydrophones and the, and the, the, the our, our chirps and our projectors, and we're interfacing it. There you're seeing it interfaced onto, onto, onto that trailing arm. Uh, we can also, we're working uh, closely with industry now uh, with, with the various AUV providers to interface it onto an AUV, recognizing, you know, the, that's where, the, you know, most of, the, uh, most of the industry is driving, is driving our data acquisition, getting folks, you know, get, getting, getting folks off, off the vessels, being able to deliver a more economical survey, faster and cheaper. Uh, certainly uh, in some regions, uh, being able to uh, have a towed vehicle um, is critical with regards to data acquisition. And we worked together with a, a European uh, platform provider and we developed our, what we call our sea kite. And what's 
what's significant uh, with regards to the sea kite. It's a towed vehicle, but it's an active towed vehicle. So we're able to control our survey line as well as our survey height, our altitude using, using this particular platform. So uh, our, the, the components of our SBI are actually embedded here into the wing of the sea kite. And these side panels control the survey line, and there are flaps on the on the leading on the stern edge of this of this wing that control our survey line. And then finally, uh, being able to uh, be on the uh, in some instances when we particularly when we're in tidal zones where where um, uh, currents are quite high, uh, important to be able to uh, be on the seafloor. And uh, this is where the tracked ROV came in in. in uh, into the into our into our portfolio because in using anything that any you know, an ROV or or track via an ROV or towed vehicle has limitations like I said in, in high current, so we've been very successful with regards to um, being able to um, um, adjust to the environment that we're in and still being able to acquire data. So the acoustic core, as I sorry the sub bottom imager as I mentioned, um, it has that 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 3D volumetric swath of data, five meters wide, uh, eight to nine meters in depth. And we're able to view it in a number of different uh, viewers on board the vessel. Um, this is our 3D viewer, but we're also able to split it up on our, pipe, pop, uh, our, on our product console and actually track the cable in our, in, in our viewer. So now, so no longer, for example, you know, if, if in many instances we have an as laid as laid line, survey line, but in many instances that the, the, the cable or the pipeline is not necessarily matching up. So we can pr actually provide that, gu that guideline, that, that guidance to the ROV operator, to the vessel owner, to ensure that we're always collecting data, real, um, the QCing of that data, ensuring that the cable, the pipeline is always in, in view. Um, there some of the you know some of the edges to the sub you know what's what is our edge in the industry it's our ability to collect that real-time data uh, yeah, being able to, our depth of penetration particularly for cables in the in in uh, in softer a uh, softer sand such as we saw we see in the Netherlands some of these cables can be buried as deep as seven to eight meters and our technology can uh, can deliver on that and the resolution is better than 10 centimeters so there's been so there's been some driving factors with regards to why we are the leading the leading sensor uh, for depth of burial surveys in Europe, and uh, and that's where we try to maintain ensure that we're always in that sweet spot of uh, of delivering to the client and being two steps ahead, so to speak, of uh, of where we need to be. This is showing how we actually view the data in that volumetric data set. So once again, you can see just like an MRI, we can rotate the data on a on our x y z axes. Now, keep in mind, we're measuring acoustic intensity. So that first reflection there uh, is the sea floor. And then that second reflection, that linear feature is actually the cable in the sub seabed. And we're, at, we're able to, to share with the client real time that estimated depth of coverage. And we can uh, interrogate if there's, a, we can see the trench, we can see if there are any boulders or other, other debris has fallen down into, 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 the, into, the, um, uh, into the trench. So very valuable, and also now if we're not if it's if it's discrete anomalies such as such as unexploded ordinances, for example, we can also tag along tag where the where we see those those features, uh, whether it be a a boulder or an unexploded ordinance, and provide uh, that type of feedback to the client, depending on the scope of work. Um, in many in many instances, particularly when you're dealing with seismic, you know having confidence in interpretation is so important. And so having a 2D view, it doesn't give you the full picture. So for example, if we just took a slice of our data set, we've got all these bright spots, so to speak, like these reflections. And you know, how do we know that this is a cable and this is a boulder, or this is a reflection of the, of the, of the trench? Well, it's, it's as a result of our ability to, to view this in a number of different views. So here you're seeing that cross-sectional view of our data. Here's a top-down view. So we're slicing down, like I said, every five centimeters now with the, with the SPI. And you can see now that we're, we're, we're slicing down into anomalies. So as on the left-hand side, you're seeing a slicing, um, slicing down into the trench. We keep slicing into, the, into that data set. 
or seeing a linear feature, which would be the cable. And that other anomaly would be a discrete anomaly, which was the boulder. So the, it's these types of tools that allow us to provide confidence in what we deliver to the client. Uh, one of our favorite stories that we tell is how we got introduced to the UXO business. Uh, this was in the, with the with an Indian Navy. Uh, they lost a torpedo uh, off of one of their submarines. This is actually a, a Google a Google photo of of the um, of the of the Navy's harbor in Mumbai. This is the conning tower of the submarine. They knew that they had lo lost a Club S missile. Uh, couldn't find it. They've been looking for it for 11 months, and heads were about to roll. And one, one cold, cold winter morning, they called us up and asked if we could get some folks over their ASAP and, you know, look at recog recognizing that, you know, we were in the midwinters and they had 30 degree plus, it did, plus the temperatures, didn't take as long to get four volunteers to head over to Mumbai. Um, it was interesting that we put our acoustic, our, our sensors in the water and within, within four hours, we, were, we picked up this data set. And so once again, this you know we're interrogating this volume of data, and uh, we uh, we knew that dimensions of the of the uh, of the um, of the missile, we knew the length to length to um, width ratio, and so that, so you're seeing a slicing down into the data set. You're seeing some hard sediment uh, sediment layers, and there right in the bottom we're seeing that discrete anomaly, that linear that that long and and long and slender. Uh, object and uh, sure enough uh, we we tagged it and they um, they they went down in and they actually picked it up and one of the reasons why it took 11 months for the other sensors to miss it was because this is a bit of a, a slice of the of our report that that anomaly was actually sitting six meters in the subseabed and uh, to be able to image something to those depths is is unique it's game changing and that really kicked us off to uh, into the world of UXOs, particularly in, in Europe, where, you know, as a result of the wind farm, the, the concentration of wind farms that were being installed right between the UK and European continent, where over 50 million bombs were dropped during World War II, it, uh, it, really, made, it really made our, our business model. And it drove our, our team from of a team of 11 people to now we have over 75 people within the company in, in over in less than 18, 24 months. Um, you know, one of the things I talked about is our ability to, to image and that imaging capability, whether we're looking at a, a ferrous anomaly, a ferrous bomb or a non-ferrous bomb, it, it makes no difference because we're actually looking at that shape. What's the shape of that of that anomaly? And that's really where we came, where, where we uh, found ourselves in, in, a, in a very, in a, in a niche market for these, uh, what I call these non-ferrous mines, which are called these LMB mines. And these were L being Lufte, the German for, for air. These were airdrop bombs that, you know, towards the latter part of World War II, the Germans were getting even smarter. And uh, they recognized that the the, that the allies were finding were able to find their 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 ferrous mines with with magnetometers but it was the aluminum mines or these lufta mines which caused significant damage to to the uh, uk fleet to the british british fleet to, uh, to, uh, towards the last uh, couple of years of, of the of the war and we were able to because we we're able to uh, image non-ferrous were actually able were, were able to not only image the shell but interesting enough in this particular instance uh, we were actually in, able to in, image the the inside components so for example this 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 anomaly here or reflection is actually the the charge of the of the of the mine this is the parachute lug and this is the battery unit so you know the technology is uh, is that is that advanced that we can provide a significant amount of information pertaining to the classification of the mine. I always like to, on my travels, I always like to have souvenirs, uh, same, same as the work. I thought this would be a great souvenir. I still have the first rock that, I, that, that, we, that we imaged uh, off of Argentia. And I was hoping that this particular uh, UXO would be my first UXO I could proudly mount, mount on, my, on my wall in my office. But unfortunately the Dutch Navy got to before I did. Want to finish up now on a few slides about you know some of our recent recent initiatives and as I mentioned we're always you know two steps ahead of that technology curve 
And what we've really, and what we've developed, Adam Young is uh, running our shop there in, 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 at, at the Cove. And, you know, we're always looking at how do we make things better. Uh, so our geo arm, which we now, which was our trailing arm that we, that when we first introduced in the marketplace, it's now called our geo arm. Uh, we want to make that more modularized, recognizing that our business is all over the world, that, you know, building one of these units everywhere we go, whether it be in the U.S. or the U.K., uh, is not is not economical. So now we've we've um, we've modularized this unit. Uh, we've worked on some lessons learned, and now we've got a pretty pretty um, significant uh, uh, rotational actuator there to support the crabbing of of the of our of of the head of the unit on the vessel. So they did a great job in 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 in, in this do, in this do, new design. And I believe Jim, it was uh, it was just. Um, tested up at the Cove just a, probably a month ago. Yep. Um, then, of course, it, we recognize that in some instances, particularly, you know, for example, we did a lot of work in uh, in London, in the Thames in London on UXO surveys. We, you know, we tried to, we, write, we were in, in literally less than, than two meters of water. Uh, you know, we kept it simple by just, you know, actually um, extending our the, the SBI off of a off of a crane. But you know, once again, because we're collecting synthetic aperture, we're using synthetic synthetic aperture to uh, to to uh, to uh, collect our data. And it's really important to have to have a stable platform. And so the team in Halifax came or in Dartmouth came up with a design for what we call the GeoLink. And uh, we're looking forward to. Uh, this is a conceptual conceptual design. We're very versatile. We can put this link. We can uh, we can put it on the side, you know, the, either the stern of the vessel, the side of the side of the vessel on a small barge, or even actually, you know, put it on the side of um, on the side of a, of of a, a pier to do testing of our of our our systems and other systems. So a very versatile versatile interface for launching our equipment. And that's something that we hope to be able to move forward with some additional support for some funding programs. Getting on smaller ROVs, really important. This is our design for a, a small little, what we call the Saab Panther XT Plus, which is a, a bit of an inspection class vessel. We started off with a, an SBI that was some 750 kil kilos. Now we're down to, a, to an, an SBI that's sub 150. So really excited with regards to what we can do with it. And finally, what's next for the acoustic core? Uh, as I mentioned, because we're now we 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 we've, we've trialed and been successful on in interfacing the sub bottom imager on a tracked vehicle, uh, we're now actually um, uh, looking at interfacing our acoustic core on a tracked vehicle, so that we can, like a checkerboard, we can collect data in five by five modules, in, um, mosaic them together, and get and get a larger acoustic core. Uh, at, uh, for deeper pen penetration. So we're not just limited to that 12 meter diameter acoustic core. Now we can, we can get wider, wider, wider area and deeper penetration so that we're more versatile as the industry change. So certainly what we're seeing, particularly in the offshore renewable energy sector is as the turbines get larger, they used to be 1.5 megawatt. Today, they're 12, 15 megawatts. The monopiles used to be five meters in diameter. Now there are some 12, 13 meters in diameter. So it was, we were, technology was growing, was growing faster than our, than our, than our, than our AC could, to, could accommodate. So this is really accommodating the, the, where, the te, where the industry is going. And it just stresses how you always have to have your ear to the ground your eyes on the your eyes on the on the horizon to be ready uh, to address your clients' needs in the future. So that's it, Jim, for me. Uh, certainly, partnership is what it's all about. Collaboration. We don't believe in reinventing the wheel within Pangeo. We believe in uh, you know you know looking at who's who does it best across our coastline. Partner up with them and to to accelerate our delivery to our clients globally. Boy, that was fantastic. Thanks very much. I'm, uh, I've got a, a thousand questions in my mind. And, and as you and I talked talk the other day, we, we could go for hours, but, but I won't. And I do want to give a chance for those on the, in the audience to also ask questions. So we have one question online right now that I'll pose to you in a second. But for those of you who are listening, either on uh, Zoom or on um, 
YouTube, uh, please do use the chat function. They will pop up immediately, and I promise I'll relay those questions as they as they come in. Question that's on the screen, and you somewhat just addressed it, is um, what trends are you seeing in the subsea imaging sector? Um, and maybe I'll sort of add beyond the you know imaging bigger pile structures, which you just alluded to. Are there other things you're seeing that um, that are uh, worthy of note? I think what's really driving the market now is you know automation. Uh, digital automation where we're getting you know we're taking the survey folks off the vessel and uh, and looking at uh, you know just doing the QCing offshore and then uh, delivering the answer product onshore uh, so you're in being able enabling your data to be able to go up on the cloud and be be viewed by by your your team you know you know in in St. John's, at the Cove, in Boston, in your clients' offices, so that you know it's really important. It's still real time data, real time data acquisition, but uh, being able to have that digitized and and processed um, onshore, so that you're taking folks off the vessel. That's really what's driving the marketplace. You know, boats are expensive, and the smaller the vessel, if you can eliminate the vessel out of the equation. Uh, then that's uh, that's key. So you know, AUVs uh, another another drive a dri another driver for for the marketplace. You sort of mentioned this earlier, but I guess implied in that is sort of an element of edge computing, so that the vehicle, the platform you're on, can make its own navigation decisions in real time based on the data that you're seeing. I guess that's kind of implied in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So auto tracking, um, auto picking. You know, you know, we started out having to have you know seven people offshore on our on our on our on you know on the vessel to you know to pick the to pick the cable now we've done we've done in enhancements on our software so that our people don't have to be there you know we want to make sure there you know certainly when if it if it is a boat driven application platform we've got to make sure we're collecting the data so that we don't have to go back again but it's uh, it's ensuring that it's auto tracking um, auto picking and uh, it's machine learning that's what's so what's really that's really where we're we're seeing our our, our innovation um, going and in, 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 in that's the direction it's going. Mm. You know, you've uh, just to kind of pick up on the marketing uh, question, um, you, you clearly transcended one market segment into many uh, using sort of common technology. So it strikes me that there's very different cultures, perspectives, uh, buying models, business models in oil and gas, uh, offshore renewables, uh, Navy contracts, you know, UXOs, they seem to be in many ways challenging but quite different markets that you've been able to penetrate uh, pretty successfully. Any, that's clearly not happenstance. You've got a grand strategy there. Any insights into how you do that? Well, I think it's being nimble and, uh, and being able to, you know, be, be with your client and, and listening to their needs and, uh, and being able to, to um, facilitate that and, and adjust, your, adjust your model. And so, for example, oil and gas, you know, big boats, big ROVs, and no one even thought about payload. And all of a sudden, we got we 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 landed into the the offshore renewable energy sector, where you know safety wasn't even was unheard of. Which so that's what we brought to the table. We what we felt we brought to the table. You know that we with that that awareness of safety and certainly that which is such a strong, strong component of the oil and gas sector. But, you know, what they slammed us back with is, you know, safety is great, but what, what, you know, at what cost? Mm -hmm. And, you know, ensuring that you're able to, you know, take, to, you know, to, to take that oil and gas model and, and switch it up such that it can, can be delivered in a, in, in a market that doesn't have the same budgets. Right. So hence the reason why we very quickly knocked out our, pay, our payload, got off the large work-class ROVs and started to be more nimble on the, on the lighter ROVs and, and different platforms such that we could reduce the size of the vessel. And also, you know, we took advantage of the, of the, of the, um, the maturity of the, uh, the renewable energy sector. You know, they weren't used to five-year frame agreements with big, large offshore, offshore vessels. So we went in and basically said, guys, look, we'll take We'll take that away from you. We'll be a one-stop shop. We'll come in and we'll provide a vessel of convenience that is fit to purpose of ours, of our, of ours, of our sensors, and do a do a turnkey or a turnkey solution. So now the note they don't have the the people and the wherewithal and the structure and the and the infrastructure to to procure to five or six different folks. So we're we're providing a one-stop shop to them, such that uh, you know it makes their life easier and it it. it 
albeit we're taking on more risk because we've got the vessel, uh, we've got you know the other the other various platforms, the survey and positioning, uh, but you know we build that into our cost. And, uh, and that's where you develop the relationships once again with the supply chain. So you get to know that you, you, you identify a vessel owner, you get to know that person, you get to know his vessel. Uh, and you know, you, work, you do back to back terms and conditions with, with your T's and C's with the client. So it's being creative there from that perspective, uh, it's important to be able to adapt. And certainly that's what we have done uh, within, uh, within the renewable energy sector. You mentioned risk. It strikes me as uh, someone who wanted to bring home an unexploded ordinance as a as a wall hanging is not not adverse to taking calculated risks. I would say you don't need to answer that. Just an observation. <laughs> no, thank you. I won't. <laughs> My father no. always would say, you know, he'd always say, you're, you know, you know, it's either you're 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 making a lot. You know, are you making a lot of money? Sorry, you're you're not make, Are you making money? If you're not, you're having fun. So uh, I like to try to balance it out and uh, make some money and have some fun. But you're right. I mean, risk is something that I have. Uh, it's part of my part of my fabric of existence. And as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you know, you you live in a world of risk. And uh, uh, but that's what excites me and uh, and uh, and and drives me forward. I know that's in your blood. I want to explore just the you know the Moya the person for a second in, in your career path because it's it's fascinating and it's um I think it's a powerful message, particularly frankly to the um, young women in the audience. And so um, just to sort of structure that question a little bit, uh, it strikes me as an engineer myself, there were not a lot of women in my engineering schools, and I'm not far different in age from you. I suspect you were probably one of few at the time. Um, you, you're at the, at, the, at the one hand, an engineer in a, in a male dominated environment. You work in oil and gas during a time when it was very male centric. Uh, you're an entrepreneur as well, and, and probably in the minority as, as a woman. Um, but you've clearly succeeded tremendously in all areas. How so? What, what's, what's the advice to the young women in the audience around all that? I mean, I think it's all about, I mean, I, I, I look at my, at my world as being sort of gender neutral because, you know, I didn't have a choice back 30 years ago when I, when I entered into engineering and keeping in mind, oh, did I just do something? I think Kyle did that. We'll, we'll, oh. we'll, we'll blame Kyle. You're okay. still there. Because right. um, I, I, I see my screen now, Jim, I don't see you anymore. Oh, um, I'm here. I can see you. Okay. We're good. Okay, very good. So yeah, so when I started out in engineering, well, first of all, I mean, I, I, I did a complete flip because I'm, you know, being a Catholic girl raised in, in St. John's, Newfoundland, I went to school, I had over 1,675 girls in, when I graduated with the Holy Heart of Mary, and then being thrown into a, to a group of uh, you know, Protestant I, male I, engineers. Yes, exactly. And I was one of few. There was there were there were two hundred folk, two hundred guys in my class, and I think there were like five girls. And and doesn't you, you kind of forget your gender after a while, you know? Now I didn't resort to all of their, their all of where they went to, but uh, you know, you you certainly uh, you you come you come accustomed to it. But what I think is really important is it's it's that relationship that and being able to that is that being honest and being true to yourself and true to the others around you. And so I think if you, if you are, if you are true to others and you treat people with respect and, you know, you recognize, you recognize one another's strengths within, within a team, I, that's what's important. So whether you're a male or a female, I think it's important to, you know, to, to value one another's contribution to the team. And uh, in recognizing that you know, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not, you may be, you may have strengths, but you also have to recognize your weaknesses and and play up on your strengths and recognize where you need to bring folks in and and uh, you don't have to be a one man show, one person show. Uh, it's important to um, to work well with other others and 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 being able to acknowledge you know your weakness. Acknowledge is when acknowledge when you've done wrong and, but, you know, look at that and, and, and take that as an opportunity to, um, to, to improve and, and, and lessons learned. So never be afraid to reach out and, and ask for help, whether you're, you're, a, whether you're, you're a male or a female and, uh, and being confident in what you, in being confident in what you know. Uh, you, you've been involved with um, the governance around the College of the North Atlantic, and you're, you're obviously very involved in the academic surroundings of uh, St. John's and beyond. Um, any observations on what's good about the current curriculum for engineers and technologists, and maybe what's missing 
reflecting on what you're saying in terms of career growth? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly engineering is a great, is a great degree to have, but certainly when I was going through, and I really think even today, uh, you know, being able to have some financial background, some business acumen, you know, folded into the, into the curriculum is really, really important. Um, I think, you know, the work terms are, are fabulous and getting out there, getting out and, you know, my first ship, my first part, my first work term was in Collingwood shipyards and talk about being thrown into a bunch of hairy ass men, you know, they thought they, they were, they thought I was a, a, they didn't realize I was a female and tried to actually bunk me up with in a, in a bunk room with eight other men. And so that was something where I was like, okay, time out. I mean, I like you guys, but I'm not going <laughs> not in that the much. place, you know? <laughs> Um, so I think the curriculum needs to be broader. I think, you know, it's, you know, uh, and appreciating from an engineering perspective, you know, we do have certain curriculum to get, you know, from an accreditation perspective, but I think there's got to be more, more involved, more cross, cross, uh, crossover between the different, the different um, uh, aspects of, of, of programs within, within, within the university and, you know, have, have the commerce, work with the engineers as opposed to us all working in a silo and rival having the rivals between the plumbers and, and and the bookies and recognizing that we need one another in order to move forward and so having more of a, a crossover between our disciplines and 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 you know and and having team projects that that include different folks from different disciplines of of the faculty i think is i think would be very valuable Mm -hmm. um, so once those folks are coming out of those post-secondaries, how are you finding um, your company's ability to actually recruit the talent you need? Are there challenges there? Are there, um, I mean, is well, there enough to go around? What, what, what I mean, like? we've been really fortunate because, you know, as a, as a technology innovator, you know, we have our own software. So we're, you know, we pull our folks, you know, pretty well green right out of university and right out of the Marine Institute. And, uh, you know, we, we really like the program that Marine Institute has because, you know, it's really, it's really hands-on programming. And they're, you know, what also, they're coming out with all their certifications. So I get folks who, you know, day one, you know, they've never been outside of St. John's, let alone, let alone outside of Canada, but because they have their, 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 their offshore certifications, I've got them on a plane going they're over to go. Tasmania, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, and they're really eager and, and we always try to recognizing that our, you know, we work in teams and it's really important, you know, how you build that team. And we always ask, rather than asking our HR manager to go out and find, find some more people for us, we, ac we actually ask our people, who would you like to work with? Who within, who did you graduate? Would you, would you think you would make a great addition to your team? So, you know, rather than relying on the executive executive searches, uh, we tend to reach out and, and, and talk to our folks internally to, to build our teams from within. I guess as if they run into you, you're probably a pretty good recruiting tool yourself. <laughs> you're, you're very passionate about what you do. I suspect young people would want, yeah. would want to work there. Um, I, I, I can be sometimes. So I know that I know when things get when things go really bad. Um, Neil Neil Phillips, my CFO, always says, "Okay, we, we need to pull out the velvet hammer." Boy, you go talk to them. <laughs> so, That'd be you. Pull out the velvet yeah. hammer, but I'm not sure what that truly means. But uh, you know, it's it, it's as my as as I as my mother would say, you get more more flies with honey than vinegar. You know. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time because we're getting near the end uh, to talk a little bit about Supercluster. And I know you're on the board of uh, Ocean Canada's Ocean Supercluster. You've had great involvement in it uh, and continue to. Um, where do you think we're at with Ocean Supercluster? Is it uh, is it where it needs to be? Is it uh, is there still some things that need to be worked on? What are your thoughts? You know, I'm, I'm you know, it was, you know, it took a while to, to get moving with the, with the super cluster because I mean, we were, you know, we started from scratch, you know, we were dealing with, you know, a lot of, a lot of money of some over, over $200 million of, of taxpayers money. And it was important that we set up the policies and the procedures to do it right. There was accountability there. Uh, it took a while to grow the team. Um, and, you know, it's interesting uh, our, our, you know, as a result of COVID, I think our last call uh, for the the accelerated call, uh, really, I think nailed nailed it. I mean, we had over, two, you know, we were struggling with regards to you know getting folks to to come in and and apply for for our our you know apply to the ocean supercluster. It was it was a slow coming to the table, 
but you know that with the accelerated program that we put out the call we put out some two or three weeks ago uh, over you know we had over 200 uh, applications come in and it was a it was a, a really it was a i think it was very uh, a great um, display of interest uh, from across canada and i think we, you know there were lessons to be learned with regards to how you know how the application was written and i think you know one thing about the team that we have within the ocean supercluster they're always open to having you know feedback and you're recognizing that the first couple the first folks that come in they're, they're pioneers and pioneers always get the arrows in the back you know so uh, you don't want to be a pioneer though you know i know that between kraken and pangea we've been pioneering it in, in different regions together and kraken i think we all know were the first folks to go through them go through that program and you know they they braved it well and uh, so did the ocean supercluster team and i think as a result of of the lessons that we learned uh, through the first couple of of uh, programs that were or um, uh, proposals that went through uh, we've learned a lot and but we're really excited with regards to this pool of 200 proposals now all of them didn't get past the but get past go uh, for one reason or another but we're actually you know there's an initiative now within the ocean supercluster to ensure we don't, you know, we don't lose that lose that momentum. And um, I believe that you know there is some 50, 50 of those proposals that are now moving forward to the next the next gate. Uh, but there is absolutely a, an a, an intent and initiative to to make it happen again to do another call uh, this summer, I believe. But I think we've really nailed it by looking at focusing on smaller, smaller initiatives, shorter term initiatives, because at the end of the day, if, you know, if it's taken me five years to deliver a solution to the marketplace, the market's going to be gone long time, long before that. Yep. You know, we have to be quick. We have to be, you know, we have to be nimble. We have to, you know, draw, deliver those solutions faster and more effective than, than the rest of the technology drivers are doing in the world. So mm -hmm. I really like the program, this accelerator program that the Supercluster has now. You know, we're learning a lot and uh, the team is growing and, uh, and, they're, and I'd like to think that we're wide open to accepting, you know, input from, uh, from, from the community to how we, can, how we can match our requirements to where they need to go. You know, just a, I, I think you're absolutely right on. I think globally, not just in Atlantic Canada and Canada, the core of the innovation in the ocean sector is medium-sized businesses. So you really have to get at their heartstrings and, and draw them into the innovation agenda, or you're missing, I think, the, the beating heart of innovation in the, in the global ocean economy. That's where a lot of it happens there. And I think it's important, you know, ocean supercluster is all about collaboration. And I think that's really neat. We've always done it, but, you know, Sometimes I find, you know, particularly in Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland, we kind of, you know, kind of work in a little silo all together. We tend, we tend not to want to talk about our, our, our not what we're doing or, or share our successes. And I think it's really important as Canadians that you know, we've got a great branding as our Canadian, that maple leaf flag, you know, you, wrap it, you can wrap yourself around it and go anywhere in the world. And it's a tremendous brand. And, and if we can take advantage of that, and uh, and deliver innovation with the, with that branding. I think uh, that is the key. And collaboration is uh, is one way of making that happen and ensuring that the industry is on side uh, together within that uh, is folded in with that collaboration. Mm. No, it makes sense. Um, there's a question coming up on the screen about uh, is is the entrepreneurial spirit sort of um, is it is it a thing that's overrepresented in Newfoundland? Is it something with the, the DNA of Newfoundland and Labrador that sort of gives you a disproportionate uh, number of entrepreneurs? Um, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, we've, we've I mean, Newfoundland for many, you know, we, we always called it that, you know, it has been province and we always had our hand out. But, you know, because we're, you know, we live in such a harsh environment, we're surrounded by the North Atlantic, you know, we've had to learn to figure things out. We didn't, you know, we couldn't rely, you know, for, hundreds of years ago, there wasn't, there wasn't, it, it, you know, the, we didn't have Canada, we didn't have the UK, we were out there. So I do believe there's something about that island mentality, uh, that, that isolation that drives innovation, you know, and, and drives that, that passion to deliver and, and to make something happen. So it, it is odd, but I think, um, I think, yes, I think it's because of, 
of where we are on, you know, in this world that, uh, that perhaps drives that entrepreneurial spirit that we see in many, many, many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Um, the COVID question, you raised it before I did briefly in passing, but um, how are things going through COVID for you and maybe what's your general observations on what that's going to do to, um, to the market, to the industry? Well, you know, certainly if I just take a snapshot of Newfoundland, I think, you know, it's really dri driving entrepreneurs. I mean, you talk to the tradespeople and everyone, you know, the people are busier than ever. I think where it's really going to, where it really has hurt is in the hospitality business, in the, mm. in the restaurants, in the hotels, and, and certainly now in the, in the summer season in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, where people rely on, on tourism, particularly, you know, folks, CFAs that come in and see our icebergs and, 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 and to, to share our natural beauty. Um, but I think, you know, certainly from our perspective, you know, we've been very fortunate that we're, you know, we've been so heavily involved in driving in, in within these uh, essential services, the offshore wind farms, that these projects aren't slowing down. It has delayed, you know, it's caused a major, it's a major headache getting our folks from one place to another place. I mean, it took three days to get our folks up to mobilize up to Norway. Uh, you know, overnighting in two two different cities just to try to catch the airfares, but it's opening up again. But I think you know it's given us actually in Canada, from a Canadian perspective, a real leg up. You know, the government came out with a seventy five percent support, and that's really allowed us to uh, to move forward and continue on with our innovation and and delivering delivering better solutions. Whereas in Europe and in particular in the UK, albeit they support supported their folks 80%, they said, go home. We don't mm. want you. We don't want you in the offices. We'll pay you to stay home. So as a result, you know, they, no one, companies, organizations, technology companies, they, they stood still. No one could do anything because of that legislation. So we took, we took full advantage of that, of COVID and reached out to every client. We had what we called opening up the black box. We reached out and because all of our folks, particularly the folks in Europe, were all sitting back, you know, waiting for someone to come knock on their door. And we, we've engaged with these folks so well and have created such great relationships because you're, you're, you're in their homes. You're able to talk about, you know, you're, you, get, you develop a, a different relationship, a different rapport. And people open up a little bit. They're a whole lot more comfortable when they're sitting in their own TV room as opposed to sitting in the in their in their white tower in the in the city of London. So the, it's more human, you know. And I I think COVID has really put humanity back into business. And I think um, it's been uh, it's been a really telltale um, adventure for 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 the world and for the globe. And I don't think we'll never go back to where it was before. But I think we can take. There's some silver lining in this, and um, we certainly plan to take advantage of that. Super. Those who are creative and resilient will um, will will come out on top. I would I would mm -hmm. argue, and you're probably one of those. Uh, Moya, I'm going to wrap right there. I, I think um, I've, I always enjoy speaking with you. I always learn something from our conversations. Um, I hope the audience feels the same way. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Pangeo, I think it's fair to say uh, contact um, through your webpage or directly. Moya or some of your staff. I know there's some people online here who are in your um, in your um, interest area. So I hope you get some um, some uh, connections out of this as well. Um, and thanks again, Moya, for for your uh, wonderful presentation, your sage advice on uh, all things related to careers and life in general. And um, always always a pleasure to have a chat with you. Thanks very thank much. You to, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Moya. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close by uh, giving you a, a just a, um, first of all, again, thanks again to Moya and for those of you who joined us this afternoon. Our next Ocean Connector is on uh, July 16th. And our presenter for that one is uh, another good friend and colleague of mine, um, Zdenka Willis. So Zdenka is a um, former U.S. Uh, Navy officer in the uh, Oceanographic Command, uh, has su subsequently ran the, uh, uh, the Integrated Ocean Observation System Program for NOAA in, uh, in Washington. Uh, has it, along the way received a, an honorary doctorate uh, from Dalhousie University in 2016, serves on a number of boards here in, in Canada and internationally, and has an amazing career story to tell, and I think some amazing things to tell us about integrated ocean observation. So our guest on July 16th will be uh, Dr. Zdenka Willis, and uh, please do join us if you can. In the meantime, um, stay well, grow your businesses, be creative, be positive, and um, Keep smiling and thanks for joining us.
Cheers.